This is Dr. George Jacento sharing ideas and examples of the use of the labyrinth in social work practice. In this video, we will discuss the use of the labyrinth in working with clients using reality and solution focused therapy. We will explore the use of the walking and finger labyrinths and uh, use of reality therapy and solution focused therapy in practice. There will be three brief video clips demonstrating the beginning, middle, and end stage of using solution-focused therapy with the labyrinth. The first and third videos uh, are demonstrations that were taped at a continuing education event for social workers in Melbourne, Florida uh, in 2015. The middle stage uh, demonstration is a role play by two students in a clinical practice with individuals course where students demonstrate their use of self in practice utilizing the various therapies they favor uh, in class. We will now review the contemporary use of the labyrinth in practice. During the past uh, 21 years, labyrinth walking has been included as a component of complementary and alternative medicine offered at a number of medical centers throughout the United States. The first labyrinth was built in 1997 at California Pacific Medical Center as part of an integrative medicine clinic. The contemporary use of the labyrinth has been primarily focused on meditation, healing, and psychotherapy, according to Artris and Johnson. One example of uh, the use of this in Florida was at a psychiatric hospital uh, where the portable labyrinth was placed on the floor of the gymnasium for a week each month and the uh, uh, clients uh, who were inpatient would walk the labyrinth if they chose to do so. Interestingly, the, according to uh, Reverend uh, Jean Miller Clark, clients experienced depression, anxiety, and life transitions and found the labyrinth to be helpful as an adjunctive part of uh, psychotherapy with their therapists. The labyrinth has become a more popular as a junctive method of psychotherapy in the late 1990. The labyrinth has been uh, termed a metaphorical stage by myself and others who work with this on different levels. Uh, it provides a place upon which to engage in therapeutic work. The metaphor of the pathway allows clients to walk a circuitous path from the entrance to the middle of the labyrinth. For instance, reality therapy assists the client to gain insight and meaning as the individual works through the three stages of the labyrinth experience, utilizing, as we'll talk later, uh, the questions of reality therapy in association with solution-focused therapy. Now, there are different types of labyrinths historically as we uh, move through time. Many of the walking labyrinths have been constructed in the United States since 1995 and are modeled after the 11th Circuit Labyrinth in Chart Cathedral, which would be the example here. The, uh, the next example on the bottom of the page here would be considered the Man in the Maze, which has been found in the southwest United States, primarily around New Mexico and the state of Arizona. The third labyrinth is called the Santa Rosa Labyrinth, and it was developed um, in, the in the 90s and maybe early 2000s. I, I believe it was in the late 1990s um, in uh, Northern California near San Francisco. And then the far right labyrinth is called the Cretan uh, model um, of a labyrinth. The labyrinth is an archetypal symbol of wholeness an unobstructed path from the entrance to the center. Unlike a maze, a labyrinth has a clear pathway in and out and does not provide any kind of obstructions as one works their way through. There are two kinds of labyrinths. The walking labyrinth, which uh, we've been talking about. There are a growing number of public labyrinths in the United States. Permanent walking labyrinths can be found in churches, medical centers, rehabilitation centers, schools, and public parks. The portable labyrinth can be folded and moved to locations large enough to accommodate it being opened up for clients. Like the portable walking labyrinth, the finger labyrinth is perhaps more portable and is easier to access and use in the therapist's office. 
The finger labyrinth works in the same way as the walking labyrinth. However, there are a few distinctive characteristics uh, of the finger labyrinth. First, it is easier to access than walking labyrinths and uh, may be more readily available as the therapist would keep a intuopath or labyrinth in the office. Second, it's convenient to secure confidentiality since it can be used in the closed setting of the office rather than in a public place where one would usually find a walking labyrinth. And third, it can provide two approaches, either the single uh, labyrinth, which we see here, or the intuopath, uh, where the client and the therapist both walk the labyrinth uh, as part of the uh, experience. Harris states that the two-person or intuopath labyrinth allows the therapist and client to um, rest it on their laps or perhaps on a table and travel the path in tandem while working on therapeutic issues. Harris asserts that the use of the two-person labyrinth leads to relaxation and more uh, quickly allows the establishment of rapport between the therapist and the client. Then moving to a movement in the labyrinth uh, walk, uh, the kinesthetic element of the 11th circuit labyrinth allows the individual a significant period of time to move from beginning to end of the labyrinth. In a normal walking labyrinth, you would be walking perhaps about an eighth uh, of a mile. Uh, the Chart Labyrinth is an 11 circuit labyrinth, and uh, the pathway circles back and forth, coming close to the center and then merging away, finally ending in the center space of the labyrinth. This process is accomplished by the individual focusing on a particular question or questions while walking. For instance, the individual may focus on the question, what do I want in my life? I've shown here a picture of a labyrinth that I've taken my spirituality and clinical practice class to walk on several occasions near the university where I work. Then looking at the types of therapies one might use in the labyrinth, um, uh, while the use of the labyrinth in medical settings has been a, a benefit to clients, uh, the use of the labyrinth in agency and private practice settings can also be an effective adjunctive process that complements other therapeutic methods such as reality therapy, uh, solution-focused therapy, which we are looking at in this uh, demonstration, narrative therapy, rational emotive therapy, and even perhaps cognitive behavioral therapy. The labyrinth provides a metaphorical stage upon which to engage in therapeutic work. The metaphor of the pathway allows the client to walk a circuitous path from the entrance to the middle. While the labyrinth can be used in combination with the therapies listed above, it has a potential to be of benefit when used with a number of therapeutic approaches as well. In the present presentation, reality therapy and solution-focused therapy were chosen as the therapeutic examples because of their focus on problem solving and fluidity in working with the clients. In the beginning stage example uh, of the video that will come up here, we saw social worker Benjamin Nieves Serrano work with the client to articulate concerns. In the middle stage video, we will see uh, the client begin to develop the miracle reality using in the inspirational word, for instance, letting go is the word that she selected, tied to her intent to move into the future. In the end stage, we see social worker uh, Benjamin Nieves uh, Serrano helping review the work in the labyrinth and begin to concretize the miracle reality by connecting the client's insights to the next week's activities. Reality therapy and choice theory, uh, one of the theories we'll use, and solution-focused is the other in our demonstrations here. Reality therapy was developed by William Glasser, who asserted that reality therapy teaches that we need not be victims of our past or our present unless we choose to. He also outlined five needs that uh, affect people and that the therapy assists them in working uh, to experience uh, and in a positive way. Uh, the needs he listed were power, love and belonging, freedom, fun, and survival. The questions of reality therapy for use in the labyrinth 
uh, are uh, quite, I believe, effective, either used uh, by themselves or with solution-focused therapy. I think the uh, result is more beneficial using both together. For instance, the first question, what do I want? This would be used while finger walking into the labyrinth from the beginning to the center and uh, fits well with uh, the solution-focused therapy approach. Uh, where one might have people do some scaling exception or coping questions, which we will look at in the slide between this series and the video example. The second question, what am I doing, would be something that might be discussed at the center in association with solution-focused therapy's miracle question, and then uh, helping develop the miracle reality about what that is that the client is wanting to um, experience and, and develop in terms of what that miracle vision would be. And then while walking out of the labyrinth after doing the work in the center and collecting the inspirational word, one might use the third question of reality therapy here, how will I know if what I'm doing is working? And again, that would be the end stage, walking out of the labyrinth and as part of that discussion and the use of the inspirational word uh, to kind of anchor the client's key uh, points and ideas in, in following that through. And then that fourth question would be, what will I do once I get what I want? This question can be used either at the end of the labyrinth walk during the current session or utilized in the next session between the cl uh, client and the therapist. I note two recent articles that uh, I've published with uh, colleagues here. And at the beginning stage of solution-focused therapy, uh, the first video uh, that follows the discussion of the questions of solution-focused therapy in the next slide is an example of uh, the beginning stage that features social worker Benjamin Nevis Serrano role-playing in a continuing education event in uh, Brevard County, Florida. He's demonstrating the presentation of the labyrinth and assisting the client to finger walk from the entrance to the center of the labyrinth. Upon entering the labyrinth, one would want to develop some baseline uh, data regarding coping exception and scaling questions which are characteristic of solution-focused therapy work. We will provide examples of these questions in the next slide. You can ask uh, the solution-focused questions just before starting the work in the labyrinth to uh, establish a baseline in terms of where the client is at the outset. And then as you journey through to the middle, perhaps you would do some of the questions again, including the miracle question, which really fits at that point. And then as you exit the uh, uh, labyrinth at the end of your uh, journey. So you may first ask the uh, question, what do I want as you begin to journey into the labyrinth? As we proceed uh, through the beginning stage, <clears throat> there are a range of questions and examples uh, here on this slide of common questions used in, in solution-focused therapy. These questions will be used throughout the work with the client. Um, developing a baseline uh, number helps the client track progress through the therapeutic encounter. Coping, exception, and scaling questions are appropriate at the beginning, middle, and end stages of your work with the client. The miracle question is appropriate in the middle stage and fits with the reality therapy question, what am I doing to get what I want? Which is a reflection on having them visualize the miracle question. And then the, uh, the exiting of the labyrinth would be, uh, how will I know it is working? would be a question one would use on the way out. But in the middle uh, stage, one may ask um, them to uh, cope, do coping exception or scaling uh, responses, comparing that to where they were at the beginning of their journey into the labyrinth. For instance, we have some good examples of questions here that one may ask. Certainly there's a range of other ways of doing this, but under coping, you might ask the client, what keeps you hopeful for the future? Or what do you do to keep things from getting worse? or even interestingly, discuss a time your problem occurred and you were able to overcome it. So here we're trying to, again, the strengths perspective is very rich in terms of this work. And then looking at exceptions to the experience, are there times you notice the problem doesn't exist? Or describe a day in the last month when your problem did not occur? Or depending on what you're getting from the client, 
What is different during the times the problem is not happening? You might want to look at a range of things from feelings to the way they look at things in terms of how you might work with that particular exception discussion. And then in the scaling questions, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being that the problem is completely solved and 1 being the problem is a complete disaster, how would you rate your situation now? Or how would things have to be in order for you to feel you were at a 9 on the scale at this point? Or describe a time when you were at 3, how did you progress to the six you are today. So using comparisons to help the client begin to think back and, and get a handle around what is going on with them and their encounter of around the issues that are uh, present for them. And then in the middle of the labyrinth, which we'll talk a little bit more in detail, questions you might use around the miracle question are, if a miracle occurred while you slept tonight, how would you know a miracle had occurred when you awakened in the morning? Or what would have to be different in your life after the miracle occurred and then a subsequent to that or another way of coming at it what would tell you the problem is never going to return so these are some ideas in terms of the uh, way of working with the various solution focused therapy questions this is the, the labyrinth, this is the intuitive path so it's a double sided labyrinth so I'm going to be doing this right along with you um, and we'll kind of go slow, it's not a race, and we'll uh, kind of explain what, what we'll be doing. So, um, first, whatever finger you'd like, um, you can put at the very tip of the, the labyrinth. So I'll move it a little bit so it's more comfortable. Okay. Um, so tell me about that. What, what maybe seeing in these places gave you some you know, hope that maybe it isn't going to be as as you enter the middle of the labyrinth you will have been discussing perhaps the reality question therapy question what do you want as you've walked into the labyrinth however you may choose not to use the reality therapy questions as well they're both two separate therapies but I think the questions go well with solution focused approaches and at this point you will transition to the miracle uh, discussion in the middle of the labyrinth you might ask if a miracle occurred while you slept tonight, how would you know the miracle had occurred when you awakened in the morning? So you'll have the client think about that and then begin uh, to describe the miracle reality as they begin to get a view of it. And you may want them even to complete some sort of artwork that depicts the miracle reality if their uh, client may be so inclined. And again, at this point, you may want to ask the reality therapy question, what are you doing to get what you want in the miracle reality? So that's very powerful because it begins to give people the opportunity to develop strategies on how they're going to move towards the miracle reality. And as the discussion continues, at some point the therapist will offer the client a basket uh, that has a number of pieces of paper with inspirational words. I've listed the inspirational words I use in my basket on the slide here so that you can get a sense of what the words might be, although there are a range of other words that are inspirational that you may also choose to be uniquely your own in this work. Um, so the inspirational word will uh, again assist the client in anchoring the miracle reality as you are working with the client both in the current session and in the future. Uh, for instance, the client may pull a, uh, a, um, a, a word like healing or resilience or compassion. That may be compassion towards the self or compassion towards another. Anyway, these words will have some significance attached to what it is that the client is working with. But take ample time to discuss the client's miracle reality and, and get it as concretely and developed as possible. And then when you determine that it's a point to perhaps move on and begin the, the end stage of this work in the labyrinth, you may again raise coping, exception, or scaling questions, all three, one or two of them, um, to begin to have the client uh, locate how they are feeling now versus where they were at the beginning stage. And most likely there will be a movement in a positive direction in terms of the numbers that you're working with with the client. This begins to have them be cue themselves to the awareness that as they begin to look at things a little differently, their uh, likelihood and hope uh, increases towards reaching the miracle reality, which they hadn't really had in mind, perhaps, when you began the work with them.
So next we will view two students demonstrating a scripted exchange in the middle phase of the labyrinth. I want to ask you a hypothetical question now that we've reached the middle, Delilah. If a miracle occurred tonight while you were asleep and all of your problems disappear, what would have happened? Well, I guess I would wake up not being worried about having been abandoned. I wouldn't worry about nobody wanting me, and I wouldn't be obsessing on how to find another guy or something crazy I can do to myself to make people care. And I would have my paintbrushes and a canvas. I see. I have an array of inspirational words here. I would like you to pick one and read it aloud to me. Letting go. What does this mean to you? I think it means that I have to let go of all the things that I let eat away at me. And what are those things that eat away at you? Well, the fact that my parents abandon me, the fact that every partner I have leaves me, the fact that I feel like I need to be in a relationship in order to be happy. Okay. Let's start our journey back out. So, how are you feeling now on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, I actually feel around a 6. Oh, a 6. And why is that? I'm not exactly sure. I feel as if I've found some sort of clarity. That's great. What are some things you can do to continue to maintain or even lower this number? Well, I can definitely keep painting. I can also really try to focus on letting go. Imagine a perfect future. What would that entail? Hmm. Well, I guess it would be with me being happy, working through my issues and being happy on my own and not having my happiness depend on others. There would be lots of painting and other activities that brought me peace. As you enter the end stage of the labyrinth, you have been uh, discussing the miracle reality with the client. At this point, you may want to ask a reality therapy question. How will you know if what you are doing is working? Take ample time to discuss the client's markers that suggest the miracle reality is being realized. Include use of the inspirational word in your discussion here. If the client becomes disappointed in his or her progress, you might have them remember to think of the inspirational word or words that they had selected. And as your discussion continues through the labyrinth and out at the end of your journey, again, check with the client regarding coping, exception, and or scaling questions. Again, beginning to see if there's a, a further progression towards the client's uh, goal and sense of well-being. The client will most likely be able to recognize some movement in a positive direction since the beginning stage of your work together, and you'll want to help kind of um, anchor that progress as you talk uh, at the end of the session that you're working with the client. And uh, next we will view the end stage demonstration by social worker Benjamin Nevis Serrano, who is uh, role-playing the therapist in this particular uh, example. Um, were there times where you, know, you thought about the assisted living facility transition that, you know, you weren't as you know, dreading it, that you weren't um, as downcast about it. Um, can you describe some of those times? It sounds like you had some of those. Oh, the time I found out I don't have to share a room when I have a little apartment and I have my own privacy, and that's very important to me. So I have that, and then I said the swimming pool, which is extremely important. And they do have a little walking path. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the um, information, getting that information that is not all negative, as it sometimes we have these perceptions of how assisted living facilities may have been in the past or how they're kind of conveyed in society. It sounds like right. we're dispelling some of those right. things and actually having some interactions with the facility. So there's a little bit of, um, uh, of uh, assurance that it's, you still have the ability to be who you are now and, and continue that way. Right. Okay. So, um, 
looks like we kind of exited the labyrinth, and it sounds like, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, I know we were at a 9, so yeah. it's... Probably still at my 9, but I'm moving towards a 10. Okay. And what would, what would a 10 look like to you? How could we maybe get to that next phase? Magical. Magical thinking. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we'll find out what that magical thinking is for you. <laughs> Okay, um, so I want you to kind of take this responsibility and um, kind of continue as that word throughout your week and, you know, times where maybe you were um, responsible and kind of um, uh, manifesting that in your life and in this transition because, uh, as you said, you still have that ability to make life what you um, want it to be, it sounds like. So, we'll uh, put, it on my put it on your refrigerator, put it in your purse, take it with you, um, and um, we'll meet back here in uh, two weeks, and we'll kind of see where you're at um, at that point. As we've seen the three video clips over the course of this um, presentation, uh, you have ideas about what the beginning, middle, and end stage uh, may look like. And um, so as you move out of the labyrinth into uh, focusing on the present in the office and towards the closure of the session in which you do the labyrinth work, you might again uh, visit the words uh, from the last question of reality therapy that seems to fit well with solution-focused work. What will you do once you get what you want? So again, that's uh, testing out that miracle reality. And again, you may uh, wish to do the coping, scaling, or exception questions. But in subsequent uh, um, visits, you may continue to work on the client's um, inspirational word in association with the solution-focused work that you're doing in bringing uh, to realization the miracle question that you've been working on with the client. And as, I as we move towards closure of the video, I'd like to refer you to a couple resources that I think have been extremely helpful to me over time. RelaxForLife.com has a wonderful range of finger labyrinths, uh, designs for walking labyrinths, labyrinth-related items, and they also offer workshops, this is in the Midwest in Illinois, I believe, around related topics uh, to do with spirituality and practice. And then uh, the organization, the Labyrinth Society, is, is a fabulous organization that has the Worldwide Labyrinth Locator online. And I strongly encourage you, if you're interested in labyrinth work and workshops, there's an annual conference that the Society offers, I encourage you to visit their website and to join the Society. I hope this has been a helpful uh, video and uh, best wishes to you if you want to continue to pursue working with the labyrinth in practice.